was actually a phallic montage of a cucumber, like, coming into the frame, like, in a close-up, um, just creeping into the frame. We were just, like, you know, cut after cut after cut that we would deliver to client. No one ever said anything about the phallic montage. Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Raika Zaytabchi and Sam Davis are on the show. If you're a longtime listener, you probably remember Raika as one of my first guests after I started the podcast in early 2019. Rika had just won an Academy Award for her documentary short, period, end of sentence. And despite her busy interview schedule with press from all over the world, she sat down with me at her home in Los Angeles to talk about her film career, how that documentary came together, how it got picked up by Netflix, and her plans after winning the Oscar. As one of my first guests, it feels like Rika is part of the fabric of the show at this point, and I attribute much of my inspiration to keep going and much of my early success to Rika's appearance on my podcast. When I interviewed Rika for episode three, I had the good fortune to meet her cinematographer on period. His name is Sam Davis. After my chat with Rika, Sam showed me his editing workstation and some projects he was working on. As he was giving me this behind-the-curtain look at his process, I had a feeling I would be interviewing Sam on my show one day. And here we are, reconnecting with Rika and Sam on episode 72. Rika and Sam have a new documentary called A Woman's Place, which is streaming on Hulu. According to IMDb, the film captures the stories of three chefs, their careers, and their shared experience as women in the culinary industry facing and overcoming institutionalized sexism. As each woman addresses the bias, harassment, and misogynist comments they've had to endure, we see how each chef has carved out a place for themselves in the industry. Not as a female chef, but as a restaurateur, a chef de cuisine, and a butcher, respectively. A Woman's Place is a film about the power of playing by your own rules, even when the game is stacked against you. What you'll learn in this interview is that even though KitchenAid backed this film, therefore making the project what is referred to as branded content, Rika and Sam were able to elevate this project into a compelling cinematic experience for viewers, while maintaining complete control over the look and feel of the film, as well as the narrative. I watched this documentary on Hulu and was struck again by the magic that Rika and Sam can work with such a short runtime. They have become masters of the economic use of screen time without skimping on production value or story. So let's jump into my chat with filmmakers Rika Zetabchi and Sam Davis. Sam Davis, Rika Zetabchi, welcome to the podcast. Rika, welcome back to the podcast. Good to see you. A year later, the world is looking a little different, but it's it's looking different. <laughs> it's good to see your face. Yeah, your hair is looking a little different too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my COVID cut. Uh, my my wife wants me to cut it down short, and my kids are like, "No, you have to have that for the podcast. It's totally a podcast <laughs> vibe." Yeah, no, it definitely works with the whole you know guitars in the background vibe you got going. Right. Yeah. So, uh, tell us about your new project. A Woman's Place on Hulu. I, I watched it, but I'd love to hear how you describe it and how that came together. Yeah, so it was a project that, um, it was a, a branded content short documentary that came to us through um, KitchenAid. Uh, KitchenAid basically came to us and said, you know, we have this uh, problem in the culinary industry where women are faced with all sorts of challenges and, and biases. Um, and it's sort of like an environment that isn't very welcoming to, to women. Um, and we also have this issue where, you know, we see like 50% of culinary school students are women, but then, you know, once they actually go out into the world, only 7% or something of, of executive chef positions are actually held by women. So really what's happening? Um, in that process, um, that's kind of turning so many people away from from the culinary industry. And so, um, you know, they they were very interested in like making a film film, so they called it. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't like 
you know, we want our brand to be very present in this, or, you know, this is, we're going to have our logos or product in the shots, or we want to do it this way or that way. They were literally like, we want you guys for the, the talent that you have as filmmakers, just being the creatives. And um, these are the subjects that we found. These are the stories that we think are compelling. And we want you to go, you know, capture the truth and go make um, a film film that uh, feels like a cinematic journey and feels, you know, really beautiful and special. Um, and we're going to kind of take a step back and let you do your thing. So and that's a really uncommon thing too in the, in the advertising world. A lot of times creatives feel very stifled in their work on, on commercials and, and branded content because the brand's hands are, you know, the, the brand is too involved and it becomes, um, it could become a really frustrating process, but this was really the opposite of that for us where the brand from the very beginning was so, um, you know, really empowered us to think big and, and try to make something that wasn't just a, an ad, so to speak. It really doesn't feel like an ad at all. Uh, you know, a piece of entertainment that, that was good enough to, to go to a major streaming platform. Yeah, it's interesting. You, I mean, you call it branded content, but I did not, when I was watching it, I had no idea that anyone would call it branded content. To me, it was just, there's a powerful message in this film. It's a very tight, economical uh, use of screen time. And um, and then you see at the end, you know, thank you, Kitchen KitchenAid and uh, the James Beard Foundation or whatever. Right. And that's know. kind of the idea, right? It's like they're aligning themselves with a cause that, you know, they feel as a brand is really important to them. Um, adding their voice to the conversation um, as opposed to saying, you know, this is like sponsored by KitchenAid. Um, it, it's really just like entering into a conversation and allow, allowing that to happen. And, you know, what's interesting is like, we're finding there's a little, you know, it's sort of the beginnings of this, right. Where there's like a trend where brands are kind of moving towards pulling away and allowing filmmakers to go out and make the projects and, um, and, and not having a heavy hand in, in the process, um, but I, you know, I think like one thing we've observed is that it's, it's really difficult and it's scary for brands to do that, to sort of relinquish that control. Um, cause traditionally, you know, model of advertising is like you have your 30 second, 60 second spot or even your branded content, short docs or, you know, other, other content that you create, but there is an agency, an ad agency involved, sometimes two ad agencies involved. There's the brand itself. Then you have the production company and then you have, you know, the director, the, the, the filmmakers, the creatives that have their hands on the project. And, um, and it, it can sort of get muddied really quickly. Um, the, the sort of initial messaging that they were, they were seek, going out and seeking. Um, but, but we were really impressed working with KitchenAid and working with Vox Media and Digitas as the two agencies that were on board this project. Super impressed with with the fact that they really, you know, they, they really walk the walk and they talk the talk. Like they, mm -hmm. they set out to do this. And, you know, even though there's like 80 other people involved in this project on the brand and agency side, there was never a single moment that I can recall where it felt like we were bogged down in any way or, or um, the vision was not being, you know, heard, or I felt like my voice as the director was not being heard or listened to and i think it represents a really exciting movement in the advertising world away from the very formatted traditional 30 60 second commercials i think i think audiences uh people are are becoming smarter than that and and i think um people are looking at content that that does feel more like entertainment and um mm. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a really exciting shift we're seeing toward, you know, away from the 30, 60 format toward longer form, you know, films that feel like films, like I said, um, where you don't feel like you're being spoon fed, a, right. a, you know, a brand's agenda. So. There's an authenticity to it. And that's really important nowadays. Yeah. I, you know, I've noticed that now that you bring it up, um, I'm looking back on an interview I did with a, uh, a marketing consultant, uh, an ad consultant named Jim Haven. And um, he had, 
he's been a part of some pretty big ad agencies throughout the world. But uh, one of his um, uh, one of his claims to fame was this Pacifico beer campaign, where he took this old Super 8 camera to the beaches of Baja, um, California, and Mexico, and followed these surfers around. And they would go to uh, remote locations in these old beat up VW vans. And, and, you know, you've got this kind of vintage looking footage, but the stories that you're seeing told through these, I, I would never call them commercials ever. They're just, they're very story driven. They're very uh, compelling emotionally somehow. I don't, I don't know how they do it in such a short period of time. I know how you accomplished it here because I mean, you have a full on documentary short here on these three, um, you know, food service workers, chef, a chef, a butcher and a restaurateur. Um, and, uh, it's, it's fascinating to me that there's this, um, intertwining that's occurring between, uh, you know, the documentary film world and, uh, the commercial, you know, these, these corporations that are looking for ways to, like you're saying, brand, branded content, tell an important story, but not get in the way of the story. Um, and then you lose, I, I think you're just going to lose the audience right away. If, there, if there's product placement, if there's an agenda of some kind, and, uh, you guys really pulled it off, uh, really well with, um, with this film. Thank you. So what were the, what were the constraints going in? Uh, were there, were there like rules that you had to follow Were the subjects already picked for you or you were, you, were you part of that process of, finding who the subjects would be and also finding the story, um, you know, sort of teasing that out of each of the subjects of the film. So this is the interesting thing is like, you know, like even if KitchenAid wants to sort of, you know, have less of a hand in, in sort of the, the creative process at the end of the day, like there are certain aspects of, um, the commercial industry and the the workflow that kind of seep into the project because you, you have your foot in both worlds. Um, and so, so KitchenAid had done, KitchenAid and Vox had done a lot of the heavy lifting before we even came in onto the project to, um, to vet and select these, um, these storytellers, if you will, these, um, these subjects. Right. And so there was a, a very kind of exhaustive research process interviewing, you know, multiple subjects and they narrowed it down to these are the, um, the people that we feel, um, you know, have really compelling stories and also together can sort of capture, um, a wider look at what women face in the culinary industry. Um, one of them being the butcher, one of them being the, the chef and the other being the restaurateur. Um, and so, so when we came onto the project, we kind of, we had those subjects ready to go, but it really became about that creative vision. How do you now tell their stories? Um, and, and what aspects of their stories do you really um, hone in on? So, so that was, that was, um, you know, really interesting process. And also it all kind of, I, I think a natural constraint of working in Brenna Cotton docs is, is that you don't get very much time with your subjects. Um, you don't, you don't get a ton of shooting days because the turnaround is, it's a lot faster. Um, it's, it's definitely not, it's, it's kind of the opposite of period where we, you know, time was the thing we really invested in where, you know, we spent 15, 20 days in India, something like that. And, um, and we went and, back twice to India. Right. right. Really our time yeah. to, to sort of get to, you know, break, break those barrier, barriers down between, ourselves and the subjects and especially talking about something taboo um with people you know from such different parts of the world uh but in, in branded content a lot of times that because there are so many moving pieces um you're 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 much more limited as far as as far as time goes like we had a very on this we had a very strict three days three days per subject um which with the documentary is is really not not a lot of time, especially when, um, you know, you're meeting your subjects on day one, you know, and, and a couple of days later, you're, 
your your rapping time is expired to capture <laughs> some portrait of their of their lives and and who they are. So it takes yeah. And you had to you had to talk to you had to talk to family members too. I mean, you just didn't have a, yeah. a subject. You were in the restaurant. You were talking to family. Boy, that's a that's a packed schedule. So, then it becomes like really important that pre planning phase, right? Just like ensuring that you're connecting with the subjects beforehand, um, plenty of times, ensuring that you have all aspects of their story. They're sort of like, you know, a, an element of like going into it, knowing what the story is going to be and knowing like exactly how you want to capture it. Which is actually counterintuitive to what documentary filmmaking is, at least <laughs> in its purest sense. Like, yeah, period, yeah. We didn't know, you know, we had, a, we had an idea that we, you know, a, a machine was going to be installed in the village right. and they were going to, you know, hopefully train local girls to operate the machine. And then, you know, maybe even sell the, you know, sell the pads to other women around the villages. And that was about, you know, that was about the extent that we, that we knew we didn't, we didn't know any of the, I mean, I think we had, we had talked with you would, you would Skype with some of the girls from India, but yeah, it was but very, very, loose, very you know, limited. And this, we don't have that luxury of getting to sort of like let life unfold in front of the camera. It's got to be more like, you know, like it has exhaustive conversations with the subjects beforehand so that she knows like, oh, you have a grandma who lives or an aunt who lives on, on, a, on a farm, you know, in rural um, Minnesota. Uh, and, you know, um, you know, that, that would be something that would be, it would be great texture for, for, for the film that we're trying to put together or, Oh, you happen to be visiting a restaurant space that you're considering leasing out you know, <laughs> in, in, during this month. And, and so it's a little bit more constructed in that sense, just out of the necessity of, you know, out of the constraint of only having three days to shoot. Right. Yeah. So it's so very different. Almost like the simplest way to understand it is like you're you're almost writing the film before you arrive there as opposed to writing the film after, you know, in post production. Yeah. But hopefully writing it, it, yeah, but hopefully writing it in a way that's as unobtrusive or, or at least uh, authentic. Yeah, as authentic as possible. So that we say writing, what we're really doing is yeah. like taking actual parts of their lives and crafting and figuring out how we can capture them all in a really short amount of time in a way Mm -hmm. that still feels yeah uh uh, not manipulative or or yeah you're not scripting it but you're you're just making sure that you're scripted about it yeah but then about scheduling but just speaking about scripting i mean the like the one of the hardest things to do when you're there on the day directing when you know you have three days and you know you have 12 hour days and you're just you know the subject has just been exposed to the camera for the first time um and you know has a film crew in their house is all of a sudden you you're trying to use different tactics to get your subject to feel comfortable and all of a sudden feel wooden or stiff in any way. Um, so, you know, that's definitely something that that's challenging on these projects as opposed to a documentary where you have time for the subject to forget that the camera is even there mm. and just look right past the camera. Yeah. Luckily, I think on, on women's place, we were blessed with some really great subjects, not only Itana, Marielle, and Karin, but their families and the people in their communities and, you know, sort of the accessory characters to their stories. Well, we got, you know, I think we were really fortunate to cross paths with some people who are just really kind of authentic and spontaneous on camera and, you know, who had big personalities that could kind of enrich their stories. Right. I, I was curious on that opening scene with Karin in the car. Um, did you, was that something you had to learn how to pull off is this this shot where the camera is outside of the car and but it, but you're hearing the audio from within the car. I thought that was pretty slick, mm-hmm. and I was like, wow. Th- I mean, this is really like uh, very cinematic and yeah. uh, you know, like a list director type of stuff. But w- what was that scene <laughs> that was like? Sam's idea. He was like so. He was like, we have to do an interview once where we're yeah. outside the car shooting from a car mount. Yeah, we're always looking for ways to do. As, you know, especially with this project, where like we wanted to kind of push it stylistically a little bit and see, you know, um, how we could make it cinematic and, and unique. And um, we didn't want to do, we, we didn't want to depend too much on formal sit down traditional interviews. So we we're trying to think of ways where we could have our subjects, whether it's like while they're preparing a dish or 
while they're driving and just sort of in a way that feels like they're almost almost like they're talking to themselves um and so the idea behind that shot specifically was just that you know maybe if we just mount the camera to the hood and let let her drive around her her community and, and, and kind of show us around uh it might lead to a a moment where she could sort of just um almost introspectively you know kind of just talk and, and maybe we'd get some some little golden moments so we we drove around for probably close to two hours i think and i we just sat back. in like the trunk basically and just, yes, yes, yes. you know, like uh, almost like having conversations with Karin myself where I was like, like prompting, yeah, kind of. prompting and saying like, oh, but, but in a very kind of relaxed and casual way, getting her into that headspace where she doesn't realize, but she's actually speaking really intimately, mm. you know, in terms yeah. of like her tone and her you know, yeah. the volume that she's speaking at, it feels like it's meditative and like she's just driving down and kind of reflecting on her childhood and all the memories she had growing mm-hmm. up in this land. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it was it was kind of setting the mood for her in that way and then kind of prompting her to, you know, talk about certain, certain things. And we actually, you know, that's some of our favorite stuff, I think. Um, and that's why you see it kind of as the opening of the film and also Which the closing. Amazing. Which is another great example of the of the of the brand brand giving us so much creative liberty because like the movie starts with like a I think it's almost like two minutes two minute long yeah long, yeah two minute on, shot on yeah of of her just kind of like waxing a little bit and um and, she, and it's kind of rambly and probably unconventional to hold on it that long and um but she's talking about survival uh, specifically in her rural farm community and how the how the weather plays such a mm-hmm. an important role in that. And we just love the idea of that uh, as a as a as a for its double meaning of um, women, her and the other subjects and all, all women in the culinary industry sort of fighting to survive, especially, you know, during a pandemic. And so we thought that that was a really Which cool it, there wasn't that. a pandemic at the time when she was talking about it. So, you know, yeah. fast forward six months later, there's a pandemic and the restaurant industry is really suffering and the mm-hmm. farming community is really suffering and there everyone's suffering, but it sort of added this other really rich, you know, context yeah. um, to yeah. it. The whole meaning of the film was sort of compounded yeah. while we were cutting it because the you know, the mountain that women in the culinary industry are climbing kind of doubled uh, amidst the pandemic where the restaurant industry now is hurting even worse. And, and the uncertainty of Karin's future and right, the exactly. future of Marielle and the future of Itana is like, you know, that there was a moment where we had finished cutting the film and we're like ready to start sending it out into the world. And like, we realized all of our subjects were actually at home in quarant- like quarantine and hadn't been working for like four months or something. Um, and that just, that just really changed the meaning. Yeah. I think we had caught the, we, we, had, we had already cut the end of the film, which is the moment, the sort of kind of like cliffhanger moment where Karen, um, we see her restaurant, her, her prospective restaurant space. And there's sort of this, you know, hopeful, hopeful, but kind of unsureness. Um, and the end, and that just took on a whole other meaning, you know, like, yeah, said, in the came like of, ghosts almost yeah, in the restaurant. Yeah. yeah this empty restaurant. Like space. our past experiences as opposed to what the future might be for Khan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that the, going back to that opening shot, I mean, what was so brilliant about it, I think Karin just so brilliantly encapsulated why the town is more complex and layered and the culture is more complex and layered than outsiders would think. And mm-hmm. so it gives her, you know, what it does for me is um, it it shows just how sophisticated she is and the choice that she the choice to stay where she's at as a restaurateur um, is based upon a pretty nuanced understanding that, you know, when people say, how's the weather, uh, that, that is not a cliche. It, we see it as a cliche because these mid, you know, these Midwesterners are, you know, simple folk or whatever, but it, it so brilliantly um, shows you why that this, this is an important community to her 
And, and I think that she, I mean, you sitting there prompting her probably elicited that, but she, um, she did a really good job with that. Absolutely. Amazing. And that's where, you know, it's a balance, right? And you feel so lucky to have such wonderful subjects that are so like in tune kind of with, with the film that you're making. Mm -hmm. So it was, like I said, we were in the car for two hours, but when we were like crammed in the backseat, kind of on, I think my leg was like, my knee was like next to Rika's face and, you know, (laughs) awkwardly holding monitors. And, but when, when, uh, I distinctly remember when she's, when she said that line, it's in the you know that kind of long soundbite in the first two two minutes of the film. We both looked at each other and we were like, oh, "Yeah, <laughs> our eyes so just widened yeah. because we knew yeah. how profound yeah. it was and how organic the whole thing felt." Right, and that's that's exciting. And we were yeah. looking for moments that we didn't have to cut into too much. Like, it's easy to you know call it Frank inviting, where you like you cut you cut tiny little pieces of 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 dialogue or interviews and you you paste it together so it's just the right you know it's hopefully hopefully the perfect line but we're we're looking more and more for moments where you know we can play out long truthful you know uncut Mm -hmm. chunks of life and and that was so perfect because you know there was nothing that needed to be cut out and it was such a sort of honest spontaneous line as you may have noticed There are great resources and advice mentioned in all our episodes. And for many of them, we actually collect all of these resources for you in one easy place. Our newsletter. You can go to dreampathpod.com slash newsletter to join. It's not fancy. Just an email about each week's episode, featured artists, and resources to help you on your journey. Thanks. And now back to the interview. So uh, what went into your choice to have this be a pretty visually dark uh film Uh, and what i mean by that is a lot of shadows and you know my my instinct as if i was going to try to be a filmmaker i'd be all right let's light up this place you know (laughs) get a light there make sure she's lit and he's lit and um but you guys really lean into the darkness of you know a restaurant or a home you're totally at peace with that. And it, it really provides some nice texture that I don't see in a lot of, um, I don't know. I just don't see it in a lot of TV or film or, or documentaries. Yeah. That's interesting. You say that. I think a lot of people like are always too nervous to, uh, to go too moody with things, but I mean, Sam can touch on this, you know, cause yeah. that's your specialty, but a lot of it is like, is from a story perspective, like, capturing really what these women deal with and experience when they go back home after work. You Mm -hmm. know, if you're looking at Itana, for instance, it's like, she's, she's in a totally different continent and um, she's by herself and she's living in a shoebox, not making any money. (laughs) Right. Right. And, um, and, and we're shooting all of this in the middle of what, February. Um, so, you know, it was winter in Minnesota, it was winter in Oakland, it was winter in, um, in London. And, um, and, and this is really like their true environment that they're dealing with. Um, mm-hmm. And it also, I think, in, in some ways, um, it helps aid the stories, their stories. Um, and then when you're also talking about the logistics of three day shoots here and there, traveling shoots, um, you want to go light. And I think there was a decision made early on that we, you know, we want to keep this feeling pretty organic and use a lot of the natural light that we had. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think to keep going back to the original point about just feeling, you know, empowered, creatively empowered on, on, on a commercial or a piece of branded content. Um, traditionally, like not, that would never fly. You know, there are, there are, so you know, it's almost a cliche to have have um, have people from from the agency or, or from the client side saying, "Can know, we just get a little brighter?" Yeah, there's, a, there's a shadow <laughs> over here, or like you know, the half, yeah. like a, a part of her face is is a, is a bit dark, or and that's so frustrating because, especially as a cinematographer, you want to be able to, you know, you want to be able to kind of push it and be creative and, and make it feel kind of painterly and shape the light and. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of our style too, to go a little bit, a little more natural and a little more moody. Um, and, and more honest yeah. too. I mean, 
you know, it's like making everything bright so that you can like subconsciously, you know, feel more happy while you watch the film is like very much of a, a, a advertising thing, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, I think it helps to, like Rico was saying, it helps the overall feel. Uh, there aren't really like, if this film is kind of a snapshot more so than like, a, you know, it's not, there's, there's, there's no plot, so to speak. I mean, there are, there are some stakes in that, that we set up and that, you know, women are up against a lot of obstacles, but it's more about tone. I think it's really important with it, this type of film to, to create a tone. And um, it's almost like our stakes in some sense come from this kind of dramatic, cinematic feeling of, um, you know, just the difficulty women face. And some of that, you know, maybe is, is enhanced by the look being yeah it's like this weight on their shoulders that maybe you don't even realize mm-hmm. but like subconsciously it's making you feel that way you mm-hmm. know because of of the the lighting mm-hmm. um and again to touch on tone it's like you look at the opening shot of the film we have an uncut shot on a hood mount you know of a of a woman just reflecting for two minutes and that is another thing that like very specifically the establishes the tone of the film right um you know that going into it, you're not about to watch something that feels very conventional. Yeah, I like it. It it kind of had the same look as Fargo. I mean, at the Minnesota <laughs> shots. I was like, is she going to go to a wood chipper? No, I, I mean, <laughs> no. But well, it, it, we were in Minnesota in like February, and it was literally the coldest place. I think it was negative twenty. More than that, it was like negative because we were out in you know we were out the there. Country. So <laughs> so like so ne- what what went into your what went into your um you know, decision-making about how to dramatize the harassment that they felt, because it, it, it was very brief and effective, you know, the techniques that you used, um, and, and, and just efficient, you know, and I, I think it, it, it was well done, but how did you approach that issue of not being too heavy handed with it, but you wanted to make the point visually? Yeah, I think it was like having fun with it a little bit. And again, we kept going, we can't believe they let us do that. There was a shot of like a cucumber a phallic, coming, a phallic, a phallic symbol. Yeah, there's a phallic <laughs> montage of a cucumber like coming into the frame, like in a close up, um, just creeping into the frame. Yeah. And we were just like, you know, cut after cut after cut that we would deliver to client. We were like, it just a gas no and we would get notes back and no one ever said anything about the phallic That's montage. Funny. I remember showing right to that. The, I think I caught that late at night or something. <laughs> and you were know, like, it's great. They're never going to let us. Yeah. I was like, that's great, but that's not there's the, no chance. like, let's try, but there's no <laughs> chance. I guarantee you they're going to come back and tell us to take it out. And they didn't, but um, had fun with those. It, yeah, it was like almost, how can we make it feel a little bit like satirical? You know, how can we yeah. just like, laugh at them a little bit um it, you know there there's like moments where the men are laughing and it's just like so dramatic and it's in slow motion and it's funny but it's it's meant to sort of you know keep us moving along and like kind of you know not not point the finger too hard or dwell too much on on some of those past experiences um as a as a funny anecdote we shot those we shot those recreations in an open um, a functioning restaurant <laughs> kitchen and who I think absolutely underestimated what having a film production in their kitchen would look like. <laughs> and we, and this is a kind of a high end restaurant and very busy. And we, they, they luckily they had two kitchens and we were in what they called the prep kitchen. Uh, but it was still fully active. You know, it, it was not like we yeah. were absolutely in people the coming in and out of the prep kitchen, working yeah. in the prep kitchen. So while we're all shooting. that stuff was shot, and it was that that stuff was like pretty heavily lit and yeah. steady cam. And, uh, <laughs> it was not small. It was, it was we a had pretty, like extras and whatever, and so it was war between the, the <laughs> restaurant staff. And, and yeah, it was and definitely a, that day was definitely a grind. But yeah, I mean, what we would do is like every every new location that we would be in, we would shoot those recreations creations kind of after we heard um every woman's initial interview we so we would, we would shoot the interviews first because we had three days and you talk about being efficient like a lot of it was pre-planned knowing what the stories were and knowing what recreations we wanted to do 
But with that said, we still scheduled their interviews for the first day so that if we got any golden moments that we, you know, didn't even we hadn't known about before mm-hmm. seeing like a towel them. Whip or something. Yeah, yeah. Like a towel right. whip, for instance, right. we, or the phallic thing, even we didn't know that was really a thing until it just organically came out, you know, in one of the interviews. So that way, you know, we, we the put the recreations, we like I think on the third day. And Our so we had came, met, came time to set to with plan. a bag full of, of gourds. And yeah. <laughs> and, and cucumbers and, you know, anything that looked yeah. remotely Alec. But it's funny. It's like those are things you have to think about when you're doing branded content. And you're doing it on a you know a short timeline. You know those yeah. are not things you necessarily you know have to be preparing for when you're doing a doc and and you're out there for a month shooting. Yeah, well, it's it's totally spot on. I mean, my first job at the age of fifteen was in a restaurant. I was a busboy, and I got to know all of the kitchen staff. And I can tell you, you know, the cucumber. I mean, it's just like you, you give a cucumber to um, a locker room full of seventh grade boys uh, <laughs> and, and it's no different than a kitchen, you know, yeah. the, the environment there. So you, you were spot on with that. And it just it totally accomplishes what you're trying to accomplish, which is this is a man's world traditionally. And, you know, when women enter, it's like they have been historically uh, been expected to just put up with the antics and the, the harassment, uh, but very well done. Uh, both of you, it's just, um, it's really good to connect with you again. Thank you. Um, I, I did see, I looked at your filmography and I saw a, a documentary short called just hold on. Was that a South by Southwest, um, entry or can you tell me more about that film? Yeah, just hold on. Sam and I co-directed that film, and um, it's a really little sort of slice of life, short, seven-minute film, and um, it premiered at South by Southwest. Uh, so the you know it was not in person; it was online because South by Southwest was like one of the first major yeah, festivals first. to cancel. I remember that. Yeah, because of the pandemic, and um, it was like a week before. I think it was literally a week yeah. before. Yeah, and um, you know we're so grateful because. It ended up, they ended up doing the online festival and we ended up um, being awarded the jury, a jury award for best Texas short. Um, nice. Congratulations. It's a fun shot in Texas. And mm-hmm. it's um, just to really, you want to talk a little bit about kind of the, where it came from, like how sure. that idea we, was born. Uh, we saw uh, the film is about a sport called a rodeo sport for children called Mutt in Boston, which is where basically where kids ride sheep, little kids, like, like three <laughs> Three to five year olds. It sounds adorable. <laughs> it's adorable and also um, a little traumatizing. Like, we, for I the sheep? The first, uh, for both, probably. Yeah. The, yeah. the first we ever heard about it was, I think we saw a YouTube video or something. One like, of these, like, like now, now this video is on Facebook. Yeah. yeah. And so oh, we yeah. had this thought of, like, uh, you know, how cool would it be to feature a little girl who's a, who's a mutton busting champ? And um, I think Rekha found. Um, Marley uh, on an article or something. This little girl who uh, had this video go go viral um, after she won the Houston like Houston Rodeo, right? Um, Mutton Bustin uh, competition, and uh, we realized after we sort of fell in love with her character that um, and and had her spunky personality in this video, we realized she also had a uh, um, a really powerful backstory of spending a, a lot of her, her early life in hospitals. Um, she had, she had brain cancer. Um, she's a cancer survivor and, um, yeah, just a really, really in, inspiring story and the type of thing that we were after a period, it was easy to, every project felt very high stakes, you know, it felt like everything had to be very big and, and, and like it targeted toward, toward major festivals or awards. And we really just made this film out, out of fun. We kind of packed up and, um, Reagan and I and uh, our producer Merdad um, went to went to Texas just for literally for two days. I think we came off a shoot, flew out that night, shot Saturday, Sunday, yeah, that was came a back fast one. Monday morning. So it was so fast that we uh, didn't have time to back up our hard drive mm-hmm. with all the footage on it. And the day that we got back and I plugged in the hard drive to start backing it up, the hard drive wouldn't mount. And oh we basically lost, yeah, lost everything. Everything. Oh the, my um, goodness. 
we f- we were able to recover it, but not after, not until basically I think doubling our, our total budget. You know, we made the film for for pennies, and and uh, and so you know we had to pay a lot of money to recover the footage. Eventually, we got it got it. I think we got everything back, and uh, we did. But wow. there was a period of like one month where we were just like, oh man, yeah. we lost it. Well, we, we didn't want to pay either because it was such a you know it was already such a small project. And yeah. We like, oh, do we really want you know do we want to invest in this? But we're glad we did. It was the type of thing we made purely you know, for fun. And, um, we didn't have, you know, big festival expectations or anything necessarily, but we, we thought South by could be a good home for it because, because of the Texas, Texas connect. Yeah. And yeah. It's a very, you know, it's a quirky South by Southwest brand type film. And, uh, yeah, we submitted it. We got in and, um, that was a surprise. It was yeah. a surprise. I remember when I was in your apartment interviewing you, um, well about period and, uh, Sam, I, w- I remember you were sitting at the computer and you had all these hard drives and I was asking you about that process and the backup <laughs> process. And you're like, yeah, we back up to this and then we back up to that. And yeah, uh, <laughs> so paranoid and it, for, for good reason. I mean, you don't want to lose that footage. Oh, absolutely. So what is the, um, what is the outlook for you as filmmakers right now, given what's going on with COVID and things opening up or not opening up? I think you just work around COVID like most people are having to do now. The um, last couple of months, we last two two months or so, we've, we've kind of hit it pretty hard going back to. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I work as a DP, so we're we're not always working together on the same projects. But um, we co-directed a narrative short. Um, There's definitely like, I think you know we've spent a good chunk of time maybe not a lot to some people, but, you know, we spent like two years or so working in, in sort of the branded space. Um, And and then also, and we still are working in branded content. Um, And then we've spent several years now working in just kind of strictly documentary. And so there's definitely a desire and a push for us to both start um, sort of expanding our horizons a little bit and, Narrative was kind Working of our, in our first. We 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 went to film school. You know, we wanted to make movies uh, and narrative films, really primarily. We kind of fell into. It. I mean, Period was Riker's first documentary. I had shot a lot of docs, but um, Period was also kind of my first, like, Real. like my baby yeah. know, documentary. And mm-hmm. uh, and so yeah, we're kind of making a, a concerted effort to get more into. Um, narrative and so we we shot a narrative short recently that we're really excited about we're going to start submitting to festivals soon all right what's the name of that film or can you say yeah it's called are you still there are you still there yeah oh, right on yeah so we're staying busy it's been, the the world is the film world is, is slowly and somewhat yeah. differently opening back up and it's it's opening back up more for like small productions mm-hmm. you know so mm-hmm. like you know, I've done a couple commercial jobs. Sam's done a couple commercial jobs. Um, you know, we've had our short film production. It, it, it's um, it's a lot easier to kind of manage and control the COVID situation when you're working with a, you know, a small kind of skeleton crew. Right. As opposed to working on a TV show or a studio film. So yeah. we're not really there yet. So, <laughs> um, so that's not really much of a concern for us right now. Yeah. Great. Well, it's so great checking in with you both and, and uh, hearing what you've been up to over the last couple of years. Um, I'd love to talk to you again when your your narrative uh, short makes it into festivals. For sure. Love to. Maybe we do a checkpoint every year. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting things going on for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys um, have a great weekend. Thank Thanks, you, Brian. Brian. All right. You guys take care. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path. <laughs>